Uh, children of God, I welcome you to our Bible start. Um, I am going to continue with our discussion um, of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Someone would say, but why do you keep talking about Jesus Christ? Now it's the seventh message and you're still talking about Jesus Christ. We know Jesus Christ. You don't need to talk about Jesus Christ so much. Now, I would say that uh, the riches of Jesus Christ, of his person, of what he came to do, and of what he is doing now up to eternity, from eternity, are so great and unsearchable that if we catch a small glimpse of them, we will pour our, our hearts to his worship. We will glorify him the rest of our lives. Now, the centrality of the Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel is not something that has to be second guessed. The Apostle Paul, introducing himself um, in the letter to the Romans, says, I am a called apostle set apart for the gospel of God concerning his son who according to the flesh is the seed of David but declared to be the son of God by the spirit of holiness. Now this very gospel was promised by or was prophesied by the prophets. Now, this is very important. In other words, what he is saying, the gospel of God is about his son, which means the gospel is a person. Jesus Christ is the gospel. You have to understand him in all his various roles and functions and activities that he carries out to truly appreciate who he is. And then we will fall at his feet like angels in heaven and say, Holy, holy art thou, Lord God Almighty. The whole world is full of your glory. You are worthy to receive glory and honor and praise and riches and mighty and power and dominion because you redeemed us. To be able to say that you need to understand the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, I'm going to read Hebrews chapter 1, uh, verse 1 <clears throat> up to verse 3. After God spoke long ago in various portions and in various ways to our ancestors through the prophets, in these last days, he has spoken to us in his son whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he created the world the son is the radiance of his glory and the representation of his essence and he sustains all things by his powerful word and so when he had accomplished the cleansing for sins he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now that's the reading of the word of God. <clears throat> Father, we thank you because of your holy word, which you have granted, granted us an opportunity to start. For we know that in studying your word, the revelation of the person of Jesus Christ will bring us into a state of awe and of worship, magnifying his name, exalting his name to the glory of the Father. We thank you so much. Speak to us by your word that we may learn to set apart the name of Jesus in our hearts and treasure it above all else in Jesus' name. Now, I have spoken on this passage in various ways, <clears throat> but today my interest is in discussing the little clause which says he sustains all things by his powerful word. 
or using another manuscript, it says, um, it says, he sustains the universe by the mighty power of his command. Now, that's Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. Now, this is a description of the sun. Verse 3 starts by saying the sun is the radiance of his glory and the representation of his essence. And he, the sun, sustains all things by his powerful word. Which means this person called the sun here is the Lord Jesus Christ. Here it says he sustains all things by his powerful word or by his by the mighty power of his command. So what I want to do is to read a sister verse which says the same in Colossians chapter 1 um, and about verse 17 or so. Um, let's see from, I'll read from about verse 15. He meaning Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For all things in heaven and on earth were created in him. All things, whether visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions, whether principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Verse 17 he himself is before all things, and all things are held together in him. Now, that phrase, that clause which says, all things are held together in him. And in Hebrews, he sustains the universe by the mighty power of his command. Those two clauses are saying the same thing. And notice that in both, in, in both letters, they are related to his creative work. And this idea that he holds things together and sustains the universe means that he is the one who protects. He is the one who preserves who is the one who maintains the universe? And when we talk about the universe, we, really, we are really looking at the entire solar system. Let's just say the entire solar system, all the planets, the earth where we, we live here, and everything that you can think about the solar system, we are saying everything is sustained by Christ Jesus, our Lord, through whose creative agents God brought these things into existence. So he is the, the agent of creation. He is the one who sustains these things. But notice that this son in John chapter 1 is called the word of God. John chapter 1 verse 1 and verse 14. He is called the word of God. And in 1 John chapter 1, he is called the word of life, which was with the father. In Hebrews chapter 19, he was seen riding a white horse and on him was written a name, the word of God. He is the word of God. Now here what's happening is that the word of God also has a mighty, also has a mighty command that he issues out. You are saying the word issues a command. The word speaks. The word issues a command. The word speaks. Now, this is very interesting. Now, so to sustain is to preserve things. To keep them together so that they do not crumble. The reason why all the, 
or the planets continue to function the way they should. The sun continues to function the way it should. The earth orbits around the sun at the, at the necessary speed. It, doesn't, it does not go too fast or too slow. Likewise, the moon. And so, so what we're saying is these things are functioning exactly as they should because Jesus Christ sustains all life in the universe. Just as he is the agent through whom God brought these things into existence. Since these things were made for him, that is, they are his inheritance. It is, it is his stewardship right to keep them, to preserve them, to maintain them. He is the very life of the universe. We bless your name, O oh God. The Lord Jesus, he holds these things together. Everything is held together. There is nothing left to chance. Everything is held together. Everything is sustained. Everything is preserved. Everything is maintained. Everything is protected by him. Whether they be stars, constellations and galaxies, planets of different sorts, hydrological cycles, seasons, everything you can think about. He is responsible for them functioning as they should. He issues out a command out of his mighty power which sustains these things. Now, let's try to move a step further in our start. I want to show that the Lord Jesus Christ is the life of the universe. If we take him out, we don't have a universe to talk about. Now, let's, let's go to Job 38. Now, we all know the story of Job, that Job had a lot of calamities that fell upon him and his friends came to console him and eventually they were sort of accusing him and all that. And at some point he was really eager to meet God and present his case before God, even though he knew that no living person can be just before God. Even if you think that you are innocent, if he looks at you with his holy eye, he will pick a dirty speck on your, on your life. Now, so now, all this has been going on for a long time. In chapter 38, God now speaks. Now, I want you to listen very carefully to this. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this who darkens counsel with words without knowledge? That's the first question God asks. Who is this who is uttering nonsense from his lips? Do you have any knowledge? Verse 3. Get ready for a difficult task like a man. I will question you and you will inform me or answer me. Now, this is very important because Job wanted to ask God questions and God would answer him. Then God changed the terms of engagement and said, I'm the one who will do the questioning and you must give me answers. Now, verse 4. Listen to verse 4 up to 6. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you possess understanding. 
Who set its measurements, if you know, or who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its bases set, or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang in chorus, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now, I want to stop there for a little while and focus on what God says here. He says, I laid the foundation of the earth. Do you know where it, the foundation of the earth is located? Have you ever found where it is? Where are the bases? Where is the foundation of the earth? Where is it laid? Where are its pillars? When I laid the cornerstone and all the morning stars, meaning angels, who are also called sons of God in this case, shouted for joy. Where were you? Do you know where the cornerstone is? Now, I want to talk about the cornerstone here. What is the cornerstone? The cornerstone is used in architecture. When they were building pyramids, all these majestic buildings, especially these very, very old buildings that you see here, including what you see today in modern architecture, they had to lay what was called a cornerstone. The cornerstone, in short, held the building together so that it would not fall apart. The cornerstone was the cohesion of the building. The stability of the building, the ability of the building to withstand wind and other forces that would come against it depended on the cornerstone, which means the cornerstone sustained the building. The preservation of the building depended on the cornerstone. Therefore, when God says, I laid the cornerstone for the earth, the question you have to ask yourself is, cornerstone? Does the earth have a foundation? Where is the foundation? Those who did signs know that the earth is founded on nothing. It is suspending it doesn't have a foundation. It doesn't have pillars. So, so what, is, what is this God talking about? Now, the first thing I want you to understand is that this is poetic language. So since it is poetic language, and this is spiritual language as well, you must not try to apply your knowledge of physics and other things here. It won't work here. But we can help illuminate what you are studying in science and physics, talking about using this God is saying here. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of the universe. The entire solar system is founded on him. That's what we read in Colossians chapter 1 verse 17 and Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. He sustains the universe by the mighty power of his command. All things are held together in him. He is the cornerstone. If we take Jesus out of the equation, there is no universe. We all vanish like mist in an instant. My friend, if you think about this person I'm describing here, Jesus Christ, 
Should, you, should not your heart be filled with the desire to embrace him, to worship him, to give him glory and honor, to surrender your life to him, to know that you owe him this life. The life is not of your own. He gave you the life. He sustains your life. Anytime the life can be taken at his sovereign will, he sustains all lives. He is the cornerstone. He is the cornerstone. Now, how does, then how does he sustain the universe? Yes, we have seen he is the cornerstone of the earth. He is the cornerstone of the earth. He sustains it by the mighty word of his command. All things are held together in him. So when we say he sustains the universe by the mighty power of his command, what are we saying? To me, it appears that um, the laws that scientists investigate, if you think the law of gravity, all these various laws, the laws of seasons and all that, all these laws you talk about, eclipses and so forth, these laws are what is being described here as the mighty power of his command. Now, this makes perfect sense. That is why Jesus could do things that are contrary to what we understand to be nature. He could walk on water without singing. He went against the force of gravity up into the heavens. So, so only him has been doing many things against nature because he is the creator. He sustains nature. These laws are in him. They are his mighty command. Now, let's see if what I'm saying is true. Now, listen here. Let's start from verse 8. We are still on Job chapter 38. We are still on Job chapter 38. Verse 8 says, Who shut up the sea with doors when it burst forth, coming out of the womb? When I made the storm clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band, when I prescribed the limits and set in place its boards and doors, when I said, to hear you may come and no further, hear your proud waves will be confined. Have you ever in your life commanded the morning or made the evening know its place, made the dawn know its place? I will stop there. Now, do you understand? There is a mention of a command here which regulates the seas. Have you ever paused a moment to think about why the Indian Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, the Black Sea, all these seas, Mediterranean, have you ever thought about the possibility that these oceans one day might actually drown the earth and it will disappear? Or have you ever thought why for thousands and thousands of years these oceans and seas have not drowned the earth? Why is it why is it not the case? Here God says, I place the limits. That's a law. And I set bolts and doors to prevent the tides from inundating the earth. I told, I commanded the earth and said, you can come up to here, but you cannot go beyond this point. 
your proud waves are confined. That's a command. Do you see that? Now, then comes your knowledge of signs and you will say, mm, well, if we go to the ocean today, we will not see the physical limits, nor will we see the boats and doors. What, what God is saying here does not make scientific sense. But you see, I told you this language is poetic. What is, what is God saying? He is telling you that his, his command by his mighty power is controlling the, the oceans and the seas so that they will not inundate, they will not drown the earth. And the oceans and the seas obey his command. Yet the sons of men, sons and daughters of men are rebellious. They don't even know or listen to their creator. They think that they owe all their existence to themselves. Following some philosophers, they say, I think, therefore, I am. They think that they owe their existence to themselves. No, 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 no. Listen. Here is a law that is regulating the oceans and the seas so that they don't drown the earth. They don't overflow, drown the earth, inundate it, and we disappear in a, in a moment. How does that happen? How does that happen? One would say, well, but God spoke about the foundation of the earth and all those things. Those are unscientific. If you read Job 26 verse 7, let me just go there very quickly. Um, if you read chapter 26, I think, verse 7, hopefully I'm right there. Um, verse 7, listen to verse 7. He, meaning God, spreads out the northern skies over empty space. He suspends the earth on nothing. Do you see that? But he was saying that there is a cornerstone, wasn't he? But now, listen here. The point being discussed here is that The forces which are being called here the mighty power of his command control the, 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 the planetary system. For example, if you look at the planet called the Earth where we find ourselves here and the star called the moon up there as well as the sun up there. The force of gravity between these bodies, the heavenly bodies and the earth itself, are regulating what is happening in this planet, including how the ocean tides behave. They cannot go beyond the limit set by God because the force of gravity is part of the mighty power of the command of Jesus. It is a command. So when we say by the mighty power of his command, a command is a law. Gravity is one of the laws which scientists investigate. And they come up with formulas of calculating gravity, but no one knows where it is coming from and why it is the nature it has. But this is what the Bible is telling you. It is a command by the mighty power of Jesus Christ. So the earth will never be drowned by the oceans. Even if all the rivers flood into the ocean, 
because the ocean tide is controlled by the force of gravity. The force of gravity is strong as the earth side, so which means these ocean tides are pulled upwards, heavenwards, and this prevents the ocean tide from inundating the earth. And so God set a limit, and it's true. He placed boats and doors to prevent the ocean from drowning the earth. Hallelujah. That's Jesus, my Lord. Wonderful and amazing works of his hands. How his mysterious word and power controls everything. Now, someone might say, no, 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 you're just trying to, to feed the scriptural uh, discussion to what we know in science. Listen here, we are still in the same chapter in Job where God is still addressing Job. Verse 32 of chapter 38, he's asking Job some serious questions. Can you lead out the constellations in their seasons? Or guide the bear with its cubs? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Or can you set up their rule over the earth? Notice, there are laws that regulate the solar system. There it is. The laws of the heavens. So you got the sun, you got the moon, you got various constellations of stars, galaxies of this sort, all these planets, right? There are laws governing their behavior and their functioning. And the very laws working up there rule on earth. Hallelujah. The mighty power of the command of Jesus. He sustains the universe. And here you have it stated plainly in black and white in the Holy Scripture. Jesus, the great Savior, the creator of the universe, the preserver and sustainer, the protector, the one who maintains the universe, the one who gives it life. So which means these laws, remember, Colossians said, all things are held together in Jesus, which means these laws are in Jesus. They are issued out of Jesus. And these laws, which regulate the solar system, rule on this earth, controlling the oceans, controlling the seasons, so that we can farm and have food and all these things. These are the mighty works of the living God. Jesus, the cornerstone of the earth. The cornerstone of the universe. The one who holds all things together. Who sustains them by the mighty word of his command. Hallelujah. Now, what does science say? Well, science says if we think about the solar system, it came as a result of a big bang. Boom! One day it was just there. So, before, it, if before the big bang happened, what was this solar system before it banged into existence. There was nothing. That's what they say. So this big bang sprang out of nothing and boom. We have the star, the moon, the constellations, the seasons, Neptune, Jupiter, Saturn, all these planets, they are up there. The earth, the oceans, the mountains, the dinosaurs, all these living creatures, birds of the air. Suddenly, they just boomed into existence. That's what science says. Why do people try to suppress the truth? 
just because they don't want science to be associated with religion. Looking at the masterful way these things are organized, the way they are weaved, the way the laws are functioning, the amazing substance constituting each of these things, rivers, mountains, wildlife, vegetation, you name it. This cannot be something that came out of nothing and by chance. This is something that was created, which is orderly, which is governed by laws. And these laws are the command of the creator himself. Hallelujah. My friend, the earth did not bang into existence, neither the entire solar system. These things were created according to the word of God. And what do other scientists say who speak about the origin of species? Charles Darwin. Well, species have been evolving over time. Human beings evolved from apes and so forth. Oh, they evolved from apes. So why are apes not in evolving into more human beings now? What stopped that process of chance? And why are human beings not involved, involved, evolving into something else? What stopped that process? You see, it's because people don't want to acknowledge that God created these things. They want to say the Bible is just a myth, is child's play, it's a lullaby for children and all that. These things show some incredible wisdom behind them. Proverbs 3 verse 19 says, By wisdom God founded or laid the foundations of the universe, and by understanding he fashioned everything you have there. And Jesus personified as wisdom in Proverbs chapter 8, around verse 20 onwards. He says, I was there in the beginning, and I was beside him as the master craftsman. Listen, when you say somebody is a master craftsman, he's an expert at, at knitting things together, at putting things together. He's a master designer of things. And that's what you see in the universe. Everything is masterfully laid out. Even yourself, when you look at yourself, you are wonderfully made. You are wonderfully fashioned. And here you are rebelling against God. Even if he fashioned thee. How foolish you are. Because the sun, the moon, the stars... All the constellations, the seasons, all these are the laws of God. They are obeying him. But the one who was created in the image of God rebels against God. Oh, how terrible the power of sin. It darkens the hearts of the sons and daughters of men. It makes them foolish when they think they are wise. And they run away from the creator and begin to worship nature and the creation in nature. Oh, Lord God. Open our hearts and the eyes of our minds that we may see these wonderful things, the wonderful works of your hands. Now. So we have shown Two important things. First, that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of the universe. And that is why he is said to hold things together in him. And that he sustains them by the mighty power of his command. That is the laws that come out of him. Gravity is one of them. The laws of the seasons. There is no way you will have winter when you should be having summer. 
There is no way you will have spring when you should be having autumn each season in its own order. And all the creation, each one obeys the exact laws that were laid when it was created. The wonderful laws of God governing everything. Now, since Jesus is the cornerstone, and we have seen that he regulates and sustains and maintains and preserves the universe by the mighty word of his command, these laws operating in nature, then it means he is the life of the universe. He is the source of life. If you subtract Jesus from these things, then there is no life on earth. Now, what I want to do is to move on to address this question or this point I've just raised, which is to say Jesus is the life of the universe. If you take Jesus out, we don't have a universe, including yourself, including me and you, we will just disappear. Now listen to Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 6. It says, you alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, along with all their multitude of stars, that is the constellations, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. Listen to what follows. You impart life to them all, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. To what does he impart life? To all. Whether it be biological life on earth, whether it be other forms of life which are not necessarily biological. Because the other thing, we, we tend to think that only li living things in terms of our biological understanding are things with life. They are different forms of life. All these lives are imparted from Jesus because he is the life. He is the self-existing one which means out of him all these lives were pronounced into existence. He is their sustenance. He is their source. Now, let's go back to Job and hear what Job says about about life that God gives life to everything. Job chapter 33 verse 4. It says, the spirit of God has made me and the breath of the almighty gives me life. What does scripture say? God fashioned man and breathed into his nostril the nostrils, the breath of life, and men began to live. Now, let's look at another portion, which is Psalm 36. I'm just selecting a few. There are so many of them, you can't exhaust them. Psalm 36, verse 6, it says, Your justice is like the highest mountains. Your fairness is like the deepest sea. You, O oh Lord, you preserve mankind and the animal kingdom. My friends, we owe our lives to God. He preserves us. The reason why when you are crossing a highway in town, or an avenue or a street. You don't suddenly freeze in the middle of the road. It's because he sustains your life. The reason why you wake up every day and not die in your sleep, he is sustaining your life. The reason why you have a marriage, a profession, aspirations, all these things you have in life, he is sustaining you. You owe him. You must worship him. You must glorify him. 
You must ascribe glory to his name. You must magnify the Lord and all that is within you, as the psalmist says. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Hallelujah. Now, let's move to the New Testament. I'll just read one scripture in the New Testament. There are actually many of them you can read as well. Um, I'll just focus on one of those, which is, um, let's look at the book of Acts. Acts chapter 17, let's start from about verse 24. The Apostle Paul is preaching the word of God and he has entered the nation of Greece and he is in a city called Athens and there he has been sharing, witnessing about Jesus Christ in the streets of Athens and then the philosophers, there's the stoic philosophers and others hear him and they're saying, what is this vain babbler saying? He's talking about strange things to our ears. Let, let us bring him before the Areopagus and hear what he has to say. Now, here is what he says. Um, let's start from verse 23 of Acts 17. For as I went... Uh, let me start from verse 22. So Paul stood before the area of Pagas and said, Men of Athens, I see that you are very religious in all respects. For as I went around and observed, observed closely your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship without knowing it, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as if he needed anything, because he himself, gives life and breath and everything to everyone. This is, this is very important. He does not need anything, which means he is self-sufficient. He does not need anything outside himself. He is self-existing, which means he is uncreated. He is the very life, the very source of life. So he is uncreated. So he doesn't need us. Our being there does not add anything to him. Our being not there does not subtract anything from his person. He is complete. Before anything was created, he was always he was always sufficient, self-sufficient. Now, but he is the one who gives life and breath to everything. And everyone. Verse 25. Nor is he saved by human hands. Uh, verse 26. For from one man he made every nation of the human race to inhabit the entire earth, determining their set times and the fixed limits of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God. This is what you, my brothers and sisters, should do. Who, whoever is listening to me, search for God and perhaps grope around for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Now listen to verse 26. For in him we live and move about and exist. Now, those are very few words, but they are jam -packed. In him we live. What does Colossians say? All things are held together in him. Exactly. And Hebrews, he sustains all things by, by his mighty, by, by the mighty power of his command. This idea that in him we live, 
all forms of life, physical and spiritual, they exist in him. For, for us to live, he must be there. He is the foundation of all life. Minus God, there is no life. There is no universe. He is the life. In him we live and move about and exist. Our existence, we owe it to him. For this reason, we must worship him. Now, let me read the last scripture and wind up my presentation. Let's go to Romans chapter 11, uh, verse 36. The Apostle Paul is now is, is discussing very important things here. Let's read verse 36. It says, for from him, that is God, and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Now, to say from him, it means everything exists because of him. He willed our existence. He willed the existence of the oceans. He willed the existence of the earth, of the entire solar system. Everything that there is, everything that is in them, he willed their existence. And through him, that is, he is the one who actually created them. And to him are all things, which means the end goal of all creation is God. Our end goal is to give him glory. And this is my challenge to you, brothers and sisters. What is the ultimate goal in your life? What is the end goal? All things are to him. To him are all things. They belong to him, but he is the end goal. All of the things are looking at him. The psalmist in different places personify and speak like this. The oceans sing praises to the mighty God. Beds of the air likewise. The trees are always howling and singing his praises, clapping their hands. Mountains skip, dancing before the God of glory, praising his name. The sun preaches his glory. The moon and the stars declare his mighty and glory. Everything, all people everywhere under the sun have heard the speech from the sun and all these, these planetary beings. They are preaching of the wonders of the excellences, of the glory of God. What about humankind? Romans chapter 1. For this reason, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness because people suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because even if they knew that there is God, God, they rejected his knowledge. They did not honor him as God, as God. They did not glorify him as God. Instead, they worshipped creatures and the creation instead of the creator. For this reason, God gave them over to, re to dejected minds. He gave them over to minds that are dirty. He gave them over to be ruled by darkened minds. And while they were thinking that they are very wise, they became fools. Hallelujah. My friends, if you have not embraced Jesus with your heart, or if you profess that you believe but haven't come, to a true conviction of the majesty of his being. This is the opportunity. Give yourself to him. 
Make a commitment to embrace Jesus and surrender yourself at his feet. For this will bring glory to God. For it is said, because ye suffered this death of redeeming us, the Father exalted him far above every name and being, that at the name of Jesus, all knees of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, that is the dead, must bow down. In that all tongues of those in heaven, the angels of those on earth, human beings, and those under the earth, the dead, must confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. I leave you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord. Amen.